uh, a lot of these commodity inputs that are used in feedlots are grown using things like glyphosate, which tie up uh, metals in the soil and make uh, some nutrients unavailable to the plant. And so those animals are eating uh, less nutrient dense food and they're then going to yield less nutrient dense food for the person eating the meat. Morning. Welcome back to the show, friends. Today in the studio, I am joined by Sam Muffet of Shirt Tail Creek Farm. Sam is a legit, real life regenerative farmer. He's got his hands in the soil. He's got chicken. He's got pigs. He's got cows. He's doing it the right way. And we talk everything regenerative agriculture. I expect to learn about his story transitioning from the corporate world of advertisement into the regenerative farming space. What the future of regenerative farming looks like, his opinions on our mate Bill Gates and his foray into modern farming, and what the importance and message is from reconnecting back to land, reconnecting to nature, and raising a family and animals more within the laws of nature. It's a really fun show. And of course, as always, we have a couple of callers who have questions about farming. Starting a little homestead, water irrigation, which animals are best, where do I start? What are some good resources to check out? So join the show if you know somebody that's an aspiring homesteader, you wanna share this with them, or if not, just sit back and enjoy the show with Sam Moffat. Welcome back to the show, Radical Health Radio family. Today, I have with me Mr. Sam Moffat from Shirt Tail Creek Farm. If you are local to Austin, you might even know about these products because you guys sell at the Austin Farmer's Market yep. weekly, delicious eggs, grass-fed beef. So today, we're talking all things regenerative agriculture and farming. But to start off, I want to know your story because you weren't always a farmer, was you? This kind of no. appeared in, in some kind of mysterious way. So what, what's the backstory there, Sam? Um, uh, well, so, you know, I, I lived in Austin for almost 20 years. <clears throat> My wife and I met working in digital advertising together. I was a partner in a, a digital advertising business in Austin and then went on to start my own business, uh, after that. And, um, you know, I, I you know, I've talked about this a lot, but I, I basically was just kind of unfulfilled with my life and, um, the only time I was ever really happy and fulfilled one was usually when I was outside breaking a sweat. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd spend a lot of time in the office on days when I just couldn't get motivated watching videos of, you know, these guys surfing these crazy waves or climbing mountains or just doing cool shit. Yeah. And, uh, and I was searching for some sort of sense of being able to pursue a passion in my life instead of just chase a, a paycheck. Mm. And, and, uh, so my wife and I had talked for years about uh, raising our kids on a farm, like moving to the country and just kind of getting out of the city and, and no real aspiration for having a, a it be a business or anything like yeah. that. And um, one day with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, my wife said, um, you know, I think, I think I'd be ready to do that. And of course I jumped on it and just, you know, I'm a man of action. So I'm like <laughs> Zillow looking like what, and uh, we found our farm. We looked at several listings online, but the only one we physically went to was the one we're on now. And um, it was bigger and more expensive than we were targeting mm -hmm. and uh, further away, but it just was awesome. And we figured it out. And, and, uh, and then once we're there, I'm like looking around all this land I'd bought and I'm like, what the hell am I gonna do <laughs> with this place? You know. And, and so it, that sort of thinking, I'm kind of one of those guys. And so that sort of thinking led to well, there's already a rancher leasing the pasture, so I'm going to buy the cattle from him and take that over. And mm -hmm. then, and then you know, well, I want my own eggs. And I had a plumber give me a, a rooster and six hens. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I thought, well, I'd like to have 30 or 40 hens. Maybe I could sell eggs to the neighbors. And, and then I you know, got a spreadsheet out and modeled out what egg thing could look like. And I was like, well, wow, like 5,000 hens is a little more interesting. And, you know, <laughs> so... so so anyway, it was kind of evolved. Um, and when we first moved out to the farm, we were just kind of doing some small scale sort of, you know, uh, stuff just to maintain an ag exemption and dip our feet in. Yeah. And, and as the case usually is with me, I, 
I very quickly just went all in 1000% and, yeah. and proceeded to give my wife lots of anxiety attacks Good. along the way. Just yeah. that's what a, a nice, reliable husband does well, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what we're there for. We yeah. cause trouble. Yeah, I like absolutely. it. Yeah. But it sounds like, I mean, it's quite a jump, isn't it? From digital marketing. I think uh, a lot of farming can often be like generational, familial. So you get there. It sounds like you're a, a man that, you know, I, I take after that as well. A good old dose of messy action, I call it. You know, just get your <laughs> yeah, hands oh, dirty yeah. and figure it out because it's going to teach you more than any spreadsheet you could have ever done. Or like, I'm sure you watch the YouTube videos and you listen to the people, maybe the Joel Salatins and you had all of these ideas, but then you just do it and you're like, oh, oh, this is, this is how we learn. So what was that process like to to go from a completely different world to taking that messy action? Like, where were you looking for inspiration? Were you talking to people locally there? Were you just winging this thing and breaking shit and then fixing it? Like, what's it been like? And I'm sure it's still ongoing. Yeah, it's it's always ongoing. It always will be, I think. You know, um, I, I, I did talk to other farms, yeah. uh, bigger farms, um, who in the beginning, the eggs was my big push uh, because I thought, well, I don't have... A, a big enough farm at the time i didn't have any lease pasture or anything so mm -hmm. it's just our place to, to i didn't have enough to really have a cow calf operation and finish mm -hmm. calves on the place and so i thought well eggs is the thing i need to be doing because i can do that because there's this other farm in elgin that's got 40 acres and they've got like twenty five thousand hens and wow you know i've got a lot more acres than that and and i don't want that many hens but uh i, I was like well that, that may be an opportunity and so yeah we we kind of jumped in on that and i will say that i i don't know i think a lot of stuff wouldn't happen these days if it wasn't for youtube yeah right because you can learn anything but yeah you know the i did all the stuff people do the joel salatin books yeah. all the youtube channels around homesteading and farming and and uh the most important thing is just you know getting some foundation of information and then taking action experience is yeah. a good teacher isn't it yeah so you got to jump out in it and start doing it yeah um, and so I spent two and a half years building mobile chicken houses yeah, in my right. pasture. <laughs> so you're a carpenter now as yeah, well? Yeah, now I am, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's so funny because I'm, I'm sitting here as a, a little kind of aspiring homesteader who has five acres, but only about an acre and a half of it is is usable, kind of farmable land, if you will. And I have 11 chickens, and I think you guys mm. have 6,000. And mm, I have three like goats, that, yeah. and you yeah. guys probably have dozens. <laughs> and now you've got cows, and now you're leasing pasture. What's the total property size you've got over there now? Uh, I think think about 350 acres right now just a, just a little patch of grass huh yeah yeah we're um you know we we the for the beef side of the business like it we have to grow grass and yes. so we plant and harvest grass we harvest both mechanically and by using our managed intensive grazing program yeah. on the farm and that is like the one thing that i think about the most that i stress about the most uh because we are you know the the pigs and chickens and laying hens are all getting fed uh, a milled ration that we have custom milled and it mm -hmm. comes from a great family farm in Georgia. Um, but we're not at, you know, we're not growing all those grains on the farm, but for the beef, we are growing the grass. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, we, it's, we need the acres. Yeah. And that's part of the regenerative story. And I want to get into that and really talk about the differences between more conventional farming, yeah. if you will, and rotational crop grazing and animals and, and all of that more symbiotic use of the land. But I also want to just focus before we move into that on, on this becoming something that you said you wanted to do more so for your family and to maybe just like live off the land and have a more peaceful, more back to nature life to now business, right? Be mm -hmm. Beef business. Like where did the name come from, for, for example, in Shirt Tail Creek and the, and the brand and the business and how soon into it was you like, oh, this is, this is legit. You know, we can actually make a living doing this too. Uh, man. So the farm was called Shirt Tail Creek Farm when we okay. bought it. It's been that, that for a long time. And um it's like getting a dog that already has a name yeah, right <laughs> we like we were like oh let's name it like you know crispy Ch i don't know what we we're gonna call it and you know and every time you try to do that and you're like nah it's just that's it's sure it tail. is what it is so we're sure tail creek farm uh, we didn't make it up it just came with that and there's a janky old sign hanging on the side of the road that had the name morley which is the people that had it before us and i scratched off some letters and turned that into moffat and it's still hanging there um but yeah uh you know that that was uh that was that yeah don't yeah. fix what ain't broken right? yeah i guess so yeah. yeah and um what is regenerative agriculture then because it's a term that gets thrown around a lot i think a lot of people in our spaces are familiar with it they love this idea of supporting farmers doing it right but for the lay person they might not even know what that term means they starting to see things like grass-fed and finished but rotational grazing regenerative agriculture 
it's the right way, and at least in my opinion, and I'm sure yours. So what are the key differences between more of a classical farming operation? Well, so, and it's interesting because what we would call classical or conventional farming now is like was not at all conventional a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, so much has changed in the last hundred years. Uh, regenerative agriculture at its core is uh, uh, farming in the image of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to mimic nature and, and create healthy ecosystems. And so it, with that comes uh, uh, balance, mm -hmm. which exists in nature. So in environments where you're growing a monocrop and you're leveraging pesticides uh, to uh, keep pests away, you're creating terrible imbalances in nature, right? Because when, when you kill a certain aphid that uh, destroys your crop, you're also killing all of the other predator insects that right. would keep the aphid in check. Um, similarly, when you are growing a monocrop of one type of plant, there's an imbalance in how nutrients are being cycled mm. in the soil because legumes, forbs, grasses, they all cycle nutrients together and they leverage the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil uh, to do that. And so, you greatly inhibit those processes when you introduce uh, chemicals and uh, monocultures, in, monocrops into the soil and onto your farm. And similarly, in, in the case of like feedlot beef, for example, mm -hmm. um, when you have a lot of animal pack, animals packed into a tight space for a long time, uh, you know, you, you create an imbalance and that, you know, uh, those guys preemptively leverage uh, medicated feed, right. antibiotics and things to try to prevent sickness from breaking out and infecting these densely populated animals. And so all of these practices uh, leverage uh, synthetic inputs at their core to uh, overcome temporarily the imbalances that are created and the risks that are associated with that. Regenerative agriculture does the opposite. Mm -hmm. It tries to mimic nature and allow nature to flow like it does. Do you get the same yield per acre uh, regenerative agriculture that you, uh, you know, you can still grow row crops uh, using yes. regenerative practices. Um, and we still produce beef and all these things, but uh, it's, it's not as efficient perhaps, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, long-term it's, it's a more nutrient dense food. It's better for the environment. And yeah, I believe it to be the, uh, I would go so far as to say that it is the correct way of producing food. Yeah. yeah. Like mimicking nature is something that I, I think we, we try to endorse here, even with the way in which we eat, it's kind of mimicking the way in which we probably have ate since antiquity and yep. the way that food systems have grown. And obviously when you confine animals to a certain space, even if it's a couple hundred acres, it's not typical nature, but that's why you use this rotational grazing, right? Cause these animals would run through and eat all the grass and then they'd continue on. So right. I'm sure you're doing cycling and things like that. Whereas the modern farming practices seem to be trying to solve problems that those farming practices are causing. It's like you're adding a step Mm -hmm. But the issue then is to go back and do it more natural, I'm guessing more expensive, more timely, um, probably less yield and all of that yeah. then is is profit and incentive driven, right? So yeah. from your take and knowing what you do now and, 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 you know, the values around what you do, you're not going back, but can you see why that model of farming is is so popular in terms of like, wow, I could do this for a quarter of the price or half of mm -hmm. the price. And it would obviously be a less um, par product. But is that really what's going on here? Is it just incentives and money and inputs and all of that stuff? Well, it's all those things. And, and I'm certainly not the world's leading expert on this, but you know, there used to be a lot of small farms in America and that changed, uh, that started changing when machines de were developed that allowed one man to farm a lot more mm. acres. Um, and I, I don't remember when it was, but it, sometime in the last 50 years, uh, and see, I'm kind of talking out of my ass here because I can't <laughs> cite the exact, but there was a push to, for farms to go big and, 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 and produce on a grand scale. And the government incentivized that, yeah. um, you know, and, and I guess the argument was we've got a country to feed and, you know, we're an exporter of grains and all these sorts of things. And, um, but, uh, you know, so it, 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 uh, you know, when, when our farm, for example, was settled by immigrants from Prussia, mm -hmm. what, what was then Prussia now part of Germany. And, um, you know, everybody had a small farm. So the, the setup was everybody had, you know, 50 to a hundred acres, mm -hmm. 200 acres, maybe not everybody, but this was kind of the norm in our area that was settled. 
And you had, uh, it was, there was uh, a component of, of it was pure subsistence farming. So mm -hmm. people had gardens, mm -hmm. uh, the neighbors would, uh, often rotate and this guy would produce a couple things. Uh, the neighbor down the road would grow a couple other items in their garden and so on and so forth. And they would pool their resources yeah. and everybody would get a bit of everything. They would team up together and slaughter a calf once a week and eat that meat, uh, you know, for a few days. And then for the rest of the week, if they wanted meat, they would go kill a chicken. Um, and, and then they would grow a cash crop, uh, cotton mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. in our area. And, and then they'd, uh, they'd have corn to feed their cattle in the winter. And, and then they sell calves obviously for, for cash too. So they had, they were both producing their own food and producing food for s people in the cities, I suppose, uh, uh, for an income. Um, that, that is no longer something, uh, well, that, that very be quickly became a lot less lucrative for people mm -hmm. to do. Um, because you know, the, the, the prices of commodities, uh, were, were, uh, will be, were, were made lower, um, through all these efficiencies. And so it was more competitive, but only if you were a big farm, right. you know, farming a huge, uh, acreage with big machines. And, you know, a lot of these guys would have a million dollars in, in debt against all their machines. And, and so it's a big, big operation. So, you know, it, things have evolved, uh, in a way that that for a long time uh, made this idea of being a small farm that supplies your community with food was just like like that's for the birds. Why would yeah. I do that? Um, and I think that's changing a bit. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, 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 formats like this are, are helping to kind of get the word out. Yeah, um, and raise awareness about a what's the quality of the food you're buying at the store, and uh, and b like where else could you be getting food? Yeah. You know, I joked before we went on air that you are almost the definition of the modern farmer in a sense. Firstly, ascended what might you might call the heights of the corporate ladder and 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 tech entrepreneurship and that kind of world, and then came back to a more natural way of living. You've got your feet in the dirt and one hand in the dirt and one hand also on a cell phone or mm -hmm. on a podcast, educating and spreading this message. And I was looking at some statistics before we got going because I remember traveling in the Philippines a few years ago and we were in the rice paddies and that was a farming practice there, but they were very, um, it was kind of feeling hopeless for them that the average age of the farmer over there was about 65 years mm -hmm. old. And in America, the average age of the farmer is about 58, so almost 60 years old. Yeah. Now you're not 60 years old and I think the trend is reversing, like you said, but how do we make this message so kind of alluring again to get people back to a more natural way of life? Because on one hand, it can look very idyllic. You know, you post sure. the beautiful sunrise, but there's yeah. also a lot of work in it too. And it, it's real work, isn't it? It's not, yeah. you know, spreadsheets and numbers. It's it's a lot going <laughs> on to it. So I guess, how do we square that circle between like, this is really important. We need more young people interested in this. It's, it is glamorous and beautiful and really rewarding, but it's also really hard too. <laughs> yeah, it's hard and, and there's risk. And, yeah. you know, people people 100 150 years ago were accustomed to having risk in their life yeah um and these days there's you know a greater proportion of the population are chasing a life where there is uh very low perceived risk there's actually risk all over the place mm -hmm. but you know and people want things to be safe and i, I hear that all the time uh but there's still a subset of, of the population that's just down to roll the dice mm -hmm. and drive their wife crazy and start mm -hmm. a farm. Um, so I don't know, man. I, I, I think, uh, I don't know how you change that. I, I think probably the, the most effective thing that I see happening right now is, is simply the conversation about health and food. We're starting yeah. to realize that you know the uh, integration of seed oils into the standard American diet uh, and all these things over the last several decades is actually uh, very clearly correlated with the rise of inflammatory diseases uh, and, uh, and you know issues with health that people are having. And so uh, it's kind of it's kind of uh, hard to uh, 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 argue that. And I yeah. think I think it's causing more and more people to want to even even just homestead and milk yeah. their own goat and have yeah. their own garden and go hunting once in a while you know yeah yeah you said so much there i love I've, I've always said this idea of the difference of a life that you might want to call a peaceful slavery versus a dangerous freedom and the dangerous uh. freedom is the roll in the dice it's the leaving what is probably very safe financially and secure and oh you know the 401k yeah, right, and right, the health right. insurance to like let's go figure this thing out and yeah. yeah, let's, let's take the risk and, but let's pursue that dangerous freedom because that's where we feel alive. And 
I'm very glad that, you, and I think you you nailed it really, that the, the overlap now between these two worlds, this health world, this farming world, and this idea that, oh, what we what we are what we eat and we are what we eat eats and mm. the health of our animals and the health of these inputs matter and bringing awareness to that and having these conversations and i think that's a very very important piece of this so explain to me in in your perspective at least why a regenerative system of of things like you know chickens out on grass and cows not in feedlots eating that antibiotic rich like why is that healthier in in what way is it healthier and, and how does that benefit the consumer well, there's a limit to how granular I can get on that just because I'm a farmer and not a nutritionist. But fundamentally speaking, you know, animals that are stuck in confinement, um, uh, you know, for, for example, that aren't maybe chickens that are in a barn and not getting sunlight uh, are not hormonally balanced. Mm -hmm. They're not going to produce the same uh, 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 nutrient um uh, composition mm -hmm. in, in in their food that that a bird that's living a healthy life outside would and you know did you hear the the joe rogan podcast with um uh will harris from white oak pastures yes mm -hmm. i mean he said it the best yeah you know it's like well you look at feedlot cattle and those are like basically really metabolically unhealthy animals that if they stayed in those conditions and kept down the path they're on on the diet they're on would die yeah. quickly yeah uh whereas my my cattle would just continue and live a 20-year life yeah. uh, on the pasture if we let them it'd be really expensive for me yeah. to let them do that but uh but they would and so and so i think that speaks for itself you know you can dive into the you know you can have meat tested and and you know the other thing is that uh, a lot of these commodity inputs that are used in feedlots are grown using things like glyphosate which mm -hmm. tie up uh, metals in the soil and mm -hmm. make uh, some nutrients unavailable to the plant and so those animals are eating uh, less nutrient dense food and they're then going to yield less nutrient dense food mm -hmm. for the person eating the meat so. yeah i feel like you know with the chickens out on the pasture the grass-fed regenerative raised cattle it is analogous to maybe how humans live it's kind of like a, a free-range human versus a domesticated human if you will uh -huh. the domesticated human that's indoors all the time never connects to nature eats the the feed you know the the non-organic feed that's just going to plow down our necks like how does that average person look and how does that average person and feel and what is the disease risk and yeah. all of that stuff and you can you know just quite simply look at that in animals too and and trust that you don't need to know all of the nutritional complexities around biology or the o3 to o6 to know that a healthy animal creates healthier food and that that is what you're trying to do and that means that you can give a healthier product like you're you guys are very well known for your eggs these mm. delicious like bright vibrant orange eggs and i know you've you spoke about this in the past there are some tricks there that people can play as mm -hmm. they get clued into this to make it but your eggs are naturally that bright vibrant color when you look at them it's like a living food when you look at a piece of grass-fed beef that's fresher it's yeah. it's a different thing but talk to me about the eggs because it is something that the people always talk about when you mention shirt tail. Yeah, oh, the eggs are next level, <laughs> like the orange, yeah. the depth of the yeah. oak. What, 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 that, so that's a healthy animal, right? But what's going on there with the orange? Yeah, so uh, the orange yolk is is a uh, correlates with the level of carotenoids that are in the hen's diet, and we custom mill a ration that is very rich in carotenoids. Um, so we do have uh, marigold and paprika in the feed, mm -hmm. which uh, enhance the the color. Um, but the, the thing about our eggs that, that I really like is the freshness mm -hmm. and the firmness of the egg. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, these are birds that are eating field mice, yes. bugs, uh, they're out in the sun, they're out in the rain. Um, and, uh, they're living as natural of a life as you can imagine. And they've got a ton of space to roam. Yeah. And they do, you know, especially in the morning and evenings, <clears throat> they spread out on the pasture and forage and it's a beautiful time to come visit the farm. Yeah. But uh, egg color. Yeah. Uh, the egg yolk is, uh, is, you know, so we do plant high carotenoid forages in the pasture for the chickens. <clears throat> But we add things like uh, alfalfa, mm -hmm. uh, paprika, and marigold, which are very high in carotenoids, um, uh, xanthophils in particular, to uh, to the, our custom feed ration to, that, that help, does help us get a, a consistently dark yolk. Yeah, and I you said the firmness, which has been really interesting mm -hmm. to me because uh, again, only got eleven chickens, but that means now I'm the, the, there's new ones just starting to lay. But I'm getting six, seven, eight eggs a day, and one of the things I really noticed is like the firmness and texture to the egg white, but the the firmness of the shell too. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like that that hardness <laughs> in the shell is probably indicative of uh, uh, you know just strong minerals and the 
ability to create a nice firm egg. So it's been really interesting for me to watch that as well and see. Yeah, and that'll that'll vary with the age of the bird. The yeah. older birds need calcium supplementation to maintain yeah. a really good shell quality. Um, the younger birds will generally put out really hard shells and, yes. you know, high quality eggs. Yeah. Yeah. So now I know you've got a little bit of an animal based story with kind of overcoming some potential, you know, gum disease and health yeah. issues there. And now you obviously kind of sit in a very good position to eat the most nutrient dense foods yeah. on the planet. So <laughs> what's been your journey in terms of transitioning and thinking about this as well? You're growing, you're giving other people some of the best foods on the planet, but also <laughs> feeding your family this way, feeding yourself this way. What's been your health journey around that? What's interesting because you know we started the farm uh you know living in austin i i always we've always bought organic or grass-fed meats uh and pro you know organic produce and and uh basically organic everything right i mean mm -hmm. we we're we were city dwellers we weren't really experts on nutrition but i just knew that organic's probably better mm -hmm. than conventionally grown apples for example um, and, uh, but you know, I, if I saw organic seed oils in, in my food, I didn't think twice about it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, whole foods, let it go on the shelf. So it mm -hmm. must be there okay. You, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because at the farmer's markets, we, we got to know a lot of people, including, you know, Paul and, and, uh, a, a bunch of the crew from the heart and soil uh, offices, uh, that were, you know, eating a carnivore diet, animal-based diet. And, um, I wasn't a hundred percent receptive out of the gates, uh, for myself, you mm -hmm. know, I thought, well, you know, that I don't have like a, I don't have, you know, uh, ulcerative colitis. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to fix something like that. And, but I did have a uh, periodontal disease, um, uh, that had been kind of a problem for many years. And I, I do all this crazy, uh, I go to the periodontist four times a year and get these deep cleans done. And I, have to do all this flossing and stuff every day and be pretty diligent about that to kind of keep inflammation down, but it's still persisted and, um, you know, some bleeding in the gums and things. And, you know, the, it, it's like a manageable thing, but the long-term outlook on that is, you know, that you, know, you can have heart problems and, you know, all hmm. kinds of other things that can be connected with poor dental health. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm kind of a, a forward thinking guy and I care about my health and, and, uh, 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 Chris Bates mm -hmm. uh, from Heart and Soil was at the market one day and told me about this guy. I think it's Ken Barry, MD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And he had this uh, episode of his show or uh, YouTube channel or whatever, um, where he, he talked to a, a dentist whose name I can't remember. And they talked about, you know, curing cavities naturally and all this sort of stuff. But they talked about, uh, you know, a carnivore diet uh, uh, and its, its potential merits for, uh, treating, you know, obviously all inflammatory diseases, but, uh, but periodontal disease being the one they were talking about. And the next day I, I told my wife, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat animal based and, uh, you know, we'll give it a couple months and see, and, and I'm coming up on two years, you know, pr pretty soon. Um, the thing is like, it wasn't, once I started it, it was like, I don't know why I put this off and, and it's, you know, all the stuff I want. And now I don't even really want, I go to a, you know, party or something and somebody wants me to eat a piece of bread. I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> it's just, there's no value there. That's right. Yeah. But, but that's been my, my journey. And of course I'm on the farm, right? So I'm producing, you know, I've got access to organs and meats and eggs. Um, and, uh, so once I made the kind of shift, it was, it was pretty easy. And now my goal is, you know, my own personal goal is to produce all the food that I eat. Yes. So we've got, we're milking our own cow now. So we've yes. got raw milk, we've got the beef, uh, you know, all the meats and eggs. And uh, we, we've got bees on the way here pretty soon. Honey, huh? Yep. Yeah, Let's so honey, go. and then uh, I just need to get fruit, fruit trees. Yeah. Fruit trees, got any maple trees on the property? <laughs> nope. All right, nope, so nope. <laughs> fruit trees, you're, you're like 95% yeah, of yeah, the way there, man. Yeah. That, that's, that's it, man, that's yeah. living the dream. And we, we've seen that so many times. It's like, once you kind of like open Pandora's box, like what are you going back to, to, you know, yeah, there's mouth pleasure in a slice of pizza and ice cream. And maybe you can have that from time to time, yeah, your yeah. kid's birthday or whatever, it's right. cool. You yeah. don't need to be so prescriptive, but the desire changes altogether. It's like, I actually don't really want it anymore. Because mm -hmm. what's in it for me? I feel great. I get to eat delicious steaks for dinner every night. I'm, right. I'm eating eggs. It's it's so good. And it's so nice to be in a position where you know as well when you're selling that you get to give that to people in a non-preachy way. I know you've said in, in the past, like yeah. you're, not, you're not out yeah. there talking about all of this stuff to people. You're just happy to get them a good product in their yeah. hands. Yeah. 
But what is um one of the things that sometimes people struggle with with this conversation is they want to do the right thing. They want to vote with the doll. They want to support farmers like you, and they will just try some grass fed beef, and they're just like, it just wasn't as good. Uh-huh. You know, it didn't taste as good. It maybe it was too lean or it was too tough. What have you learned about the actual growing process of how to figure that out between doing it the right way and also producing great tasting animal of which plug intended it is great tasting so you figured it out so what is that well you know it, it's kind of fascinating so like the the american palate is not the same as the argentine palate or the even the european palate perhaps and people in america uh, uh have become accustomed to corn-fed feedlot mm-hmm. beef and so the standard for what is a good steak is particularly in the u.s is a heavily marbled fatty to end tender uh, piece of beef. Um, what I notice, uh, you know, so we aim for uh, a, a carc, a beef carcass that is fatty and marbled. Mm-hmm. Um, not every animal has the exact same genetics, so there is variation. But generally, you can avoid most of the issues with toughness and, you know, dry, overly lean meat by simply making sure your cattle are never going backwards, never losing weight. And by making sure that you're not slaughtering them before they're ready. Hmm. A lot of farms get into maybe a cash flow crunch where they need ribeyes and they've got these cattle. And it happens to us seasonally a little bit. There's a weird little transition period where we're bringing in younger calves and our older calves are just about gone. Maybe we had a boost in sales and and there's that. And it's never like they're really young, but it's just there's that period. You know, so, you, you know, there's always some variability. And, hmm. and uh, I think most grass-fed producers can speak to that. Mm-hmm. But, but then there's the conversation about like, well, what is beef? What, what has beef always ever been? And, you know, what kind of meat were humans eating? I mean, if, if you're coming at this from a standpoint of nutrition and wanting to be sort of ancestrally aligned, then, you know, the, the conversation about, well, this isn't like that Wagyu mm-hmm. steak I had at Ruth's Chris, like shouldn't be happening, you no, know? Right. We're supposed to chew meat. It's, every piece of beef is not gonna be tender. That's yes. not the way it is. Um, now, if you're having a tenderloin filet and it's tough, then there's a problem, yeah. and, you know? Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, but, but, but it's interesting because, you know, uh, my friends, I have friends from Argentina and they tend to like more uh, well done, uh, slightly tougher, yeah. meat yeah um and in america you know we want this uh you know heavily marbled piece of meat and you know in, in the u.s we had the cattle drives that uh you know cattle were rounded up in texas and driven up to kansas city and uh perhaps fed and then slaughtered and and that whole system uh, for, from a very long time ago um was kind of established that that sort of commodity beef right mm-hmm. there was a, a disconnect between uh, the, the, the rancher and, uh, and the person eating the beef. Whereas what I've read about the way things evolved in Europe, which is obviously a much older continent, is that there was a much closer relationship between the producers. Uh, I know that's changed since, but you know, in, in the last hundred years, it was, it was a more, uh, more, more close relationship than we have typically had in the U S mm-hmm. where you had producers that might, go to the pub and run into a guy that ate their beef mm-hmm. and, and was like, Hey, that was a crappy roast. Yeah, right. I got off that. Hey, you know, you, you, buy me a pint. You screwed yeah. me over, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I it's a, that's a whole separate sort of um, rabbit hole, but I think it's interesting the way that food preferences vary uh, by different, um, you know, areas. I think I, I just experienced that actually. I was I was back home in England and Spain um a couple of weeks ago and I'm always looking for the beef. That's sure. that's my go to, yeah. you know. So I, I was I was getting the steak where I could get it, especially in Spain, if this makes sense. It was very beefy beef. Mm-hmm. Like it was so beefy. And it was different, you know, and you mentioned uh Wagyu, which to me is a strange obsession. I I've, I yeah. don't actually know if I've had any. I maybe had a Wagyu burger or something, but you see these steaks going for a uh, hundred dollars for a single steak and i'm looking at that and i'm like that's i mean maybe it's delicious i don't know but it's a metabolically unwell animal that is Mm -hmm. like very lots of intracellular fat buildup like what are they doing to those cows they just basically pumping them full of food to get them as marbled as possible and genetically selecting out certain you know types yeah in some cases there i mean i'm not this is not a blanket statement but there are uh cases of people that produce wagyu beef that go to extremes of uh, limiting the movement of the animal mm. and 
and just wanting them to get really fat and be really tender. And it's pretty gross. Yeah. I've eaten Wagyu beef. Don't get me wrong. It's, yeah. it's a decadent kind of experience, but it's not everyday beef. Yeah. Um, and uh, I typically stay away from uh, grain fed beef when I can anyway. I mean, which I usually can, right? Because yes. I produce, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a different sort of product. You know, yeah. I have a lot of people like, Oh, do you want to get into Wagyu? And, and, um, uh, my response is no. I mean, I'm very happy with Angus beef. It's, yeah you know, uh, good, uh, uh, English breed cattle. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and we actually do have some Wagyu cows that I, I sort of had to purchase in order to get a lease on a property. The guy had right. Wagyu cattle and, right. but, but yeah, they're just kind of out there and occasionally we'll process one and not even yeah tell anybody. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that, um, and, and I know this isn't necessarily a goal to, you know, change the world overnight but one of the arguments that is commonly thrown at something like regenerative agriculture is it can't possibly be scalable mm -hmm. we can't possibly feed everyone this way yeah how much truth is there to that from your experience and if it, if it is true is there a middle ground or is it is that not true in your perspective like what's the story there well you know i it it, it makes me kind of want to talk about um how much of the food that's being produced by our current agricultural system is being used for food. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and then, well, like corn, for example, is grown for ethanol and stuff like that. Um, but the, uh, there's also a question of like how much stuff do people need to be eating people? I, I see this a lot and I talk about this quite a bit, especially recently. Um, you know, you go to the store and I'm, I'm always looking and noticing, uh, this, if I have to go to a grocery store, which I rarely do. Um, there's a lot of unwell looking people filling their carts with absolute garbage. So, um, you know, uh, gosh, and then there's a lot of waste as well. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm kind of derailing from your question. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the magic bullet is, but I, I think, you know, and, and Will Harris, who I admire uh, from uh, uh, White Oak Pastures, talks about this uh, in, in, when you hear him speaking, um, is that it, it, the answer probably isn't to have really gigantic regenerative farms. Mm. It's to have more regenerative farms, particularly around uh, metropolitan areas that can supply people with food. Um but, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think there's probably a mixture of uh, finding a better middle ground with larger scale agriculture that's a little bit more sustainable. I mean, maybe in the next 50 years, let's say. Yeah. Um, and also uh, creating uh, an environment and having dialogues like this to open people's minds, yeah. young mm -hmm. people's minds to this idea that actually that is a path they could pursue. Yeah. I'm passionate about that. I mean, I, I get people that call me a lot and want, want me to tell them, give them all the steps on how to start a farm. And, and, and they are like, I don't want to mess up. So I want to talk to you first. It's like, buddy, uh, I'll help you. But like, I, I, I only have so much time in the day. You're going to have to go mess up and figure it out. Um, but fortunately there's a lot of content out there to help people. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I think just kind of continuing to push the dialogue and, and make the case, right? The, 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 we're making the case right now for people that have six years ago never owned a cow or chicken, uh, you know, are now this year probably going to sell about $2 million worth of food off of our farm. Um, that's a pretty big deal for a little, you know, 350 acre operation. Yeah, um, I'd say so. And so uh, it can be done. Um, but I, I think the answer, you know, the reality is it's like you're not going to just transition the country to a 100 percent small regenerative no. farm system anytime soon. And mm. so I think, you know, uh, I, I don't know, you know, lobbying, it, it's tough, man. It is tough. Yeah. yeah. I often think about this as being a very grassroots movement in the sense like I've talked about this um, a lot about really being intentional if you're in the position to vote with your dollar to support yeah. the the local farmer and the incentives drive outcomes and if we can change the incentives and 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 the the dollar is being voted with in those right places that hopefully it actually makes what you do a little more sustainable for the farmer too because it is a two-way street right the consumer wants to buy the best product you also want to make it the most available as you can to people but full transparency here the right beef raised the right way is not as cheap it can be twice as much as the yeah. conventional stuff so yeah. we're, we're in a bind as well between certain people are priced out of that yeah. so it's like it's very important 
for the people that can to do that because maybe hopefully that can bring the price down to this amount of dollars or maybe they can get creative and do cow shares and buy a half and split that with their buddies or something. But it's it feels to me like it's going to be a grassroots movement of the people that can vote with the dollar doing that to incentivize the change, to make it easier for you guys, to make it a little bit cheaper for those guys. And now we're in a, a very symbiotic relationship. Yeah. And, and and then again, you know, everybody doesn't need to be eating ribeye. That's right. Yeah. I mean, ribeye is a treat and yeah. I don't eat ribeye that often. Yeah. You know, I, I mostly eat ground beef, you know, yes. and, and mm -hmm. our caveman blend I eat. But, you know, so getting people to think about food as fuel rather than as uh, some tasty decadent experience they want to have every time they eat. Yeah. Yeah. So. The nose to tail argument, the you know, that you bring up, which is a very good point. Like, yeah. Steak just isn't New York strips and ribeyes right. and, and the choice cuts, the fillets, right? You can get into all, you know, the the, the shanks, the organs are a huge oh, yeah. fan of here. Like it's all incredibly nutrient dense yeah. and trying to use the most of the animal that we possibly can. You don't have to spend $35 a pound on that's all right. your beef. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. ground beef. What, what was the caveman blend? Is that got some organs blended up in it? Yeah, that's our ground beef mixed with liver and heart. So it's about 20% organ meat. That's and, amazing. Yeah. And 80% ground beef. And that's really cool to see that those options are available too. Is that just at farm? Market, so you're in stores with that too. No, we ship it nationwide and uh, in stores, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Are you, you know, being on the farm and, and obviously processing a lot of cattle now? Are you because the goal here sounds like it went to reconnect with nature and to reconnect with a more simple way of life? Yeah, how connected to that whole process have you been able to be with the actual processing, with this nose to tail environment, with getting your hands dirty, so to speak? And, and what was that experience like coming from the tech world? Yeah, it was interesting. When we first started slaughtering cattle, I made a point of going and being present for every every slaughter. And, you know, and, you know, when you grow up, I grew up in the suburbs of Houston. Uh, meat was a, a thing you bought at the store. Um, I mean, you know, we all know it comes from a cow, but, you know, whenever the, the nasty part comes into your mind, it's like, la, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I thought it was important because part of this journey for us was connecting with our food and, 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 uh, getting back to basics. And so I, yeah, I went and, and was present for, uh, several of our first, uh, slaughters and, and, um, and there was a part of me that was, uh, it was a sort of upsetting and appalling. Uh, and at the same time, it was necessary. And you got to come to terms with the fact that humans eat meat and have forever and, and should, I think. And, uh, and so why was I having those feelings? I was having those feelings and my wife and I have this conversation a lot because she's much more affected by the fact that we raise things that get killed for meat still. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, but I think, you know, to a, a huge degree, the, the reason why people are so conflicted about it is because they've been, they've grown up so separated from it. They've had no exposure to it. And, you know, when, when our first Thanksgiving living in the house on the farm, we had raised a couple of turkeys and I went and slid a turkey's neck with my kids and scalded it and plucked it and gutted it and put it on ice. And we smoked it the next day and it was the best damn mm -hmm. turkey I ever mm -hmm. ate. But, you know, my kids are, are growing up in an environment where that's just like, yeah, yes. that's, what, that's what we do. No big deal. Daddy killed a deer. Let's go skin it. Yes. And let's, oh, there's the liver and heart. Let's get those. Yeah. Um, whereas when I grew up, it would have been like, ew, yeah. you know, I don't want to touch that. So, yeah, it's, uh, and it's, it's a big conversation. Yeah, it's, it's much more human to me, I think. Um, you know, this, this idea of like remembering who we are, where we came from, that that's been a huge part of our life for so long. And you, you, you hit the nail on the head with the kind of like when, even when you're saying those things to me now, being more connected and, and more into this of being more in nature also exposes you to the death that is inherent in nature. Mm -hmm. And you see the cyclical nature and I've seen the birds get eaten and I've, yeah. see, I've, I've seen death up close and personal. And I think you're just right. I think we've become so terrified of that entire concept that to see it reflected in an animal is a reminder of our own mortality, maybe. And it's just so scary. And it's so like, oh, it's weird. It's gross. So let's not do it. And that maybe brings up another point around, you know, one of the counter narratives that's emerging right now is that well, we don't need to do this. Why kill animals? Why, you know, yeah. why, why can't we just have the rainbows and the furries, like you said, and these <laughs> monocrop fields as yeah. far as the eye can see? Why, yeah. why be such monsters and consume the right. rotting flesh of dead animals? These, these more plant-based arguments. Yeah. You're a guy that's got your hands in this work and you're doing it. 
How do you now look at that argument and, and maybe what I would also deem as a, just a disconnect from reality, but what's your take on it? Is it, is it even, is it even possible? Is that realistic? What's going on there? Well, I, I, again, I think people have been so sheltered from the reality of food and, and they've got so much time on their hands to hyper intellectualize things that, uh, you know, people have landed on, um, uh, on veganism, for example, as a viable option. And I think it's pretty evident that that is a, a, a subpar way to uh, get nutrients into your body. Um, and I know there's like, I've read, you know, books uh, on th that have got me in the past thinking about, well, maybe plant-based is the way yeah. to go. There's a great, there's a very interesting book called How Not to Die. Mm. And, uh, and, and it, it'll make you think, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, fundamentally, um, you know, and I can say from experience, from my own experience that, you know, eating an animal based diet and eliminate, eliminating grains and, and sugars and many plant foods from my diet has been a great optimization. Uh, but yeah, I think I think people have just been really sheltered for a long time and um, and 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 their their experience with animals is with uh, their little puppy dog yeah right or or you know or some horse at, 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 or some animal at a zoo or something like that and um and so it's just not rooted in um on the reality of the world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it's like we've been eating meat for thousands of since the beginning of our existence mm -hmm. so why wouldn't it be a good idea to keep doing i mean uh, if we're going to stop eating meat, if the human race should stop eating meat, then should wolves also stop eating meat mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by that rationale? Like mm -hmm. what, where does the, where does the buck stop there? Yes. You know? Yeah. So. And you get, you, you get into all of these very interesting arguments around, well, the wolf doesn't have a choice and the human has a choice and you're choosing to perpetuate the suffering. And I think again, that disconnect with reality, you know what it's like to manage land. You know what it's like to run a tractor through there and take down the, the, those tall grasses to make yeah. hay and the amount of ground dwelling animals that are killed and the birds circling above for days as they pick apart the ripped carcasses. Like life requires death, you know, yeah. death requires life. It is all very cyclical. And I live in middle rural Tennessee now. I'm driving around. I'm looking at just pasture upon pasture of these cows. And I'm just like, thinking about a time where I had a similar moment to you where I was like, maybe plant-based is the way to go. It mm -hmm. was on the back end of watching Cowspiracy and the whole cow fats are destroying the environment oh, and they yeah. use so much water, etc. And now I'm driving around like in the country and being like, then I'm looking at these plant-based factories churning out there. So the jet fuel that's required to bring in the acai from the Amazon or whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's the disconnect you're talking about. It's just not realistic. Also, I wonder, I mean, this is <laughs> something, this is a question right here is, if you if if people stop eating beef and we stop producing beef and the cows stop farting as much, but then all the vegans are farting way more, <laughs> like how, what what's the offset there? You I know? don't know, man. <laughs> hmm, we might yeah. be in trouble. We need to do some. We need Bill Gates to do some math on that for us. Yeah. Speaking of yeah. our friend Bill <laughs> being the largest owner of farmland in the uh -huh. United States right now, you being a, a I mean a small large yeah. owner of farmland. How does that make you feel? It's it's a little weird because he's not trying to do regenerative agriculture, right? He's trying to monocrop fields so yeah. they can make more impossible burgers or whatever this is. And and you mentioned earlier on in our conversation that, that those inputs and outputs don't sync up. You can't just take, 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 and take without putting anything back in. So is it? I don't even think it would be feasible to do that land of the vegans and, and row crops and corn and soy as far yeah. as the eye can see. But you're, you've probably got more of a nuanced take on that. Is it? Would it be even possible? I don't know, man. It's terrifying, though. Um, you know, I think Bill Gates should stick with making computers. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know the specifics about what he intends to do. I know. I know what I've heard in the press, and and I don't know much about Bill Gates. But um, you know, fundamentally, I think uh, things need to change. With I don't think large scale agriculture is going to disappear, but I think you know some things need to change, um, and that's a that's a that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, I think we, as a culture, we've become kind of very technocratic and we think that technology is, is going to be the thing that saves mm -hmm. us. And maybe that's just the incentives though. We, we'll figure this out. We'll develop a new hybridized seed or a special, you know, a special kind of glyphosate that hopefully doesn't cause cancer and, and mm -hmm. hurt people. And, 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 and maybe, who knows? Um, but I also feel very much more drawn to this natural way of doing it. And in my experience, when I think about more of that 
dystopian planet of the vegans and you know the no beef beef is a treat you know because of the climate etc i don't see a technological solution is i see more of a like technology in the hands of farmers like what you're figuring out now is an ancient form of technology mm -hmm. at least as far as i can see it you're learning soils like humus the word uh one that we use for soil is very closely related to human it's like it's almost yeah. like the soil is who we are the soil is almost like the soul it's like very connected have you felt that moving back from an environment that was very technologically based into a now we're in you know the soil and real animals and and blood and poop and death and life like how much more of a different kind of intelligence would you say that is versus the intelligence that you had before of you know code or whatever it was well the earth is doing its thing and we need to learn to work with the earth and work with nature and allow the forces of nature that exist to exist. And we need to learn how to work within those. And so the, I think the approach has been, let's control all these variables um, with, you know, poisons and antibiotics, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's all there for us, but we have to, be willing to work in the way that na nature dictates. And that's what people don't want because people, if you've got a 5,000 acre farm and some guy comes along and says, if you buy this chemical product and put it on your farm, you're gonna get 20% more yield, put more money in your pocket. And, uh, and, and that may be true in the short run, but um, the, the long-term prospects of uh, most of this conventional style farming, row crop farming in particular is not good. Mm. Um, so we, you know, in my experience, you know, I came into this without a conventional farming background. I, now full disclosure, my, my mother's family grew wheat in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up around that, uh, in the summers and things. And so I had some, I had uncles that ranched and farmed and, and I was riding on the combine and, and riding on the tractors in the field and, and, and seeing that. And I, of course I thought the machines and stuff were really cool, but but I, I didn't grow up really learning how to do that. Um, so I came into this with a fresh perspective and with an open mind. And, um, and, and it was even scary for me because a lot of the land where we are is pretty mined of its nutrients. Mm. You know, uh, years of growing cotton as a cash crop and never putting anything back in um, uh, have taken their toll. And in, interesting aside, on our farm in particular, the, the big pasture across the road where our laying hens are is where the cash crops were historically mm. grown on our farm. The pasture behind my house that goes down to the creek is our better ground. And I always wondered why. And I've talked to old timers in our area that said, well, that's because they only ever ran cattle in that pasture and they mm. grew all their row crops out in the pasture across the road. So Very it makes, makes a lot of sense to me. But we came into this uh, with a fresh perspective and 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 uh, in the beginning, our ground was we did soil testing and found that our ground was incredibly depleted of phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen, too. And so my initial approach was to plant legumes to fix nitrogen in the soil. But in order to get the legumes to set a good root and really flourish, they need the potassium and phosphorus in the soil. And so we applied potassium and phosphorus fertilizer. I tried to do this organically. Um, I could have spent twenty thousand dollars to uh, uh, for bone meal, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, for the phosphorus to uh, to put it across uh, fifty two acres at the time, and we ended up using, uh, uh, I guess, a synthetic uh, phosphorus and potassium for about twenty five hundred bucks. Um, now that's not something I want to do routinely, mm -hmm. but uh, because we were farming soil that was so mined of its nutrients, if you want to get the process, get the party going, as I like to say. If you're just gonna drill seeds into dead ground, it's gonna take a long, like I'll be dead before that mm -hmm. land is back to the way it, it once was. Whereas if you can give it a little bit of a jump start and get things going and get the structure back in the soil and the organic matter there, then things start kind of jiving. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've come a long way and I've seen the effects of the cover cropping and, and the planting of legumes with our grasses and rotating chickens and pigs and cows across the pasture. To some degree, this is, and this is a long-winded response, but to some degree, this is uh, a, a leap of faith, right? Mm -hmm. But but for a guy with a fresh perspective, it was a little easier to have. Um, now, for conventional farmers that are out there with row crop, crop operations, I can sympathize with why they're not just jumping on the regenerative 
bandwagon because it's scary. It's it's there's a at least a perceived risk. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're not going to get quite as much yield, but then your input costs won't be as high mm -hmm. either. And mm -hmm. and there's a great book called Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown, who talks about this specifically. And that book is really geared towards row crop farmers going regenerative. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I recommend it to people. But uh, anyway, that was a kind of a long winded response to. But yeah, I mean, I, it's reconnecting and allowing nature to function the way nature needs to function and learn how to farm within those parameters is is what you have to do in regenerative farming yeah yeah you know? i love it and it sounds more hopeful to me that even if soil is depleted and beat up a little bit because of these farming practices that if we take a more nuanced approach and then use nature little kickstart like you said little supplement like yeah. supplements have their place to fix little inputs yeah. and then you get it going the way that nature intended that it's rehabilitatable mm -hmm. if that's a word because yeah. that's always the fear right we hear the doom and gloom of like we're just killing our soils and once the soil's gone the food's gone and once the food's gone now we're in a really bad problem but we can save it but it seems like we can only save it with animals so there again we arrive at this you know just using plants and just using seeds and just using chemical fertilizers mm -hmm. probably isn't the solution to this right so we're going to transition into taking some calls cool. in a moment. But the last thing I wanted to ask you about is as we've explored this topic of, you know, reconnecting and listening to that, you know, nature's wisdom and all of that. One of the big motivating factors or one of your whys for doing this was also um, based on your family and the kind of lifestyle that you wanted for your kids. So yeah. what's this taught you about being a parent and what kind of lifestyle does it afford you now as opposed to maybe the more conventional route that you would have been going living in the city? Well, you know, it's always a struggle to find balance in life. Um, and um, I think, you know, one thing that was important to us was that our, we grew, raised our kids in an environment that would allow them to go experience nature um, and not in the form of a metropolitan park. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with those, but uh, we wanted uh, more sort of organic, you know, no pun intended experience for the kids. And so... And, and, and that's there, that's present. And, uh, it's funny because they have no point of reference. So they're yeah. where people are like, do you like growing up on a farm? They're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> like, I, I don't know, get yeah. away, get away from me. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, th then again, also, you know, and, and I'm constantly fighting a battle by the way, like my mm. kids go to public school, mm -hmm. uh, there's soda and all this garbage and they give them brownies and they incentivize kids uh, way too much with sugar. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I'm always, you know, at, at breakfast, I always make their breakfast every day and, and, uh, I'm, I'm pushing eggs and fruit and things like that. And they're complaining. They want, well, Joey gets hot pockets, you know, <laughs> or, uh, or yeah. pop tarts or whatever. Yeah. But uh, no, it's 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 been great raising kids uh, in this environment, and my hope is that uh, one day they'll look back and realize that their folks did something yeah. big, big for them. No, yeah, but I don't know. Well, I think they will, man. I'm I'm hopeful. It's like you said, it's that more free range person, and I think they're probably learning a lot more than they even realize, and and you even realize that looking back in the future, they'll be very grateful for that. You know, there's definitely. There's definitely something about it, you know. I'm doing that to a large, uh, to a smaller scale myself, and I and it just it feels right, you know. It feels more human. It feels more free yeah. range. You know, there's there's uh, it, it almost seems like there's uh, in this context two sort of groups of people. There's the people that really embrace technology, um, uh, technology and food production, technology in their life. Have you ever seen the movie Idiocracy? Yeah, like mm -hmm. that's kind of happening, you know, yeah. just like. People are just kind of like, you know, consume social media, have a Slurpee, mm -hmm. you know. Put the eat, VR goggles on. Yeah, yeah, around, yeah. And just and just get really unhealthy and just be like, yeah, I'm beautiful. And, yeah. and, and, and then there's the people that are like, wait, this doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what, what is my body really supposed to be consuming? And, and uh, what's my, what, you know, how should I feel? And, and is it normal to just plan on that you're going to be on six different prescribed medications by the time you're 50 years old? And, and, and so I'm, I'm really encouraged by the sort of group of people that are, uh, growing a conscience around this and, 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 and you guys are doing that, uh, and, and having that conversation publicly, but it's, it's alarming to me. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think the way we're trending right now with everything from AI to Bill Gates, uh, owning all this farmland and pushing, uh, uh, for a plant-based world, um, 
is kind of terrifying, but then I, I find hope in, in uh, what, you know, people like you guys are doing uh, yeah. with your platform and, and Paul and, you know, Paul's been a big, I, I'm a big fan of Paul's by yeah. the way. And, 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 um, and I think, you know, it's, it's doing a lot of good to you know, open people's mind. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that the gratitude extends both ways as well, because of course we wouldn't even be able to have these conversations if we didn't have the farmers doing it right. And I, I feel almost like, we need in this space collaboration because we're we're fighting a giant, if you will. You know, yeah. it's 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 Thanos of big food and and these more, to me, dystopian technocratic futures of you know globalism or whatever, and and this real lived experience of being a human, which people like you are fighting for, we are fighting for, and all of these people in this space are combining together to try and raise everybody up to say, hey, there is an alternative, and the alternative is is dirt and real food and play and human connection and not maybe the life through the lens of the filtered curated yeah. you know lifestyles of everybody else so thank you for doing what you do and yeah hopefully this conversation just encourages people to keep on that journey and keep voting with the dollar so that is um about time to wrap it up for the conversation portion of this but we yeah. also have a couple of callers on the line which are always very fun so the way this goes i'll bring them on the line they'll say hello and they got questions for you sam oh, so okay. let's hear it we got uh leah from alabama who's on the line first leah why don't you jump on say hello and let us know uh, what we can get into with you hey this is leah i'm in alabama and we are about to close on 30 acres of land and we have interest in regenerative farming chickens, those barns, tractors, where do you recommend we start? Man, uh, are you wanting to actually start a business doing this? No, no. We just want to care for our family yeah. and be a part of a community and live natural and slow down. You can do a little bit of everything on, did you say 30 acres? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I mean, the lowest hanging fruit, uh, the easiest thing to get going would be to start raising your own broiler chickens. Um, and you know, there's, there's a ton of content on YouTube about how to build your chicken tractors and how to rotate your birds, uh, and, and build your brooders and everything. But that's a, that's an easy one. It's something the kids can get involved in if you've got kids and, um, and, uh, and, and it also, it's a quick turnaround, you know, within a couple of months, you'll have birds to process. And so that's, that's an easy one. And then of course, you know, gardening, uh, is a no brainer if you're, uh, if you're wanting to get some veggies and fruits, but yeah, yeah. Uh, for meat, you know, the, the broiler chickens is easy. And then maybe even getting a couple feeder pigs and raising a couple hogs and having them slaughtered to fill your freezer would be, uh, you know, something you could dip your toes in on too. Thank you. As far as the chickens go, do you have different chickens to slaughter and different chickens that lay eggs? Yeah, usually we do. Um, there's a bunch of breeds of chickens you can select for both. Um, um, for meat, uh, we like the Freedom Rangers. Um, there, you know, the, the, the chicken industry generally uses Cornish crossbirds, which are bred to grow to enormous size in a short period of time. We don't like them as much because they tend to get too big and have mobility problems. Uh, so I'm a fan of the Freedom Rangers for meat. Um, they're pretty hardy. They still have the instinct to peck and run away from danger and, and all those sorts of things, uh, but they still yield a good meat bird as well. Awesome. Thank you. You bet. Good luck. Thank you, Leah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to follow up on that real quick before we move to the next caller because you mentioned pigs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in this space that we can, uh, pigs get like sh sh kind of shunned a little bit because mm. of the, you know, the poofer content, the mm -hmm. higher and that they're a monogastric animal. But there's a way in which you can do soy and corn free pigs and choose the right kind of feed. And I know you recently introduced those mm -hmm. at Shirt Tail. What are you doing to try and do pigs the right way talk to us about that a little bit because i think and i get uh, you know a, a local pig slaughtered it's all done the right way it's yeah. forested and all that yeah. it is unbelievably yeah. delicious so yeah. the power of the pig i'm all about it but what's your take on it well so uh you know we rotate our pigs across the farm usually in our more wooded areas and this last season we planted a lot of turnips and so we're rotating the pigs on the sections of the farm that had turnips nice. growing on them and um, we try to create an environment that allows the pigs to forage and, mm. and get as much as they can off the pasture. Same with our chickens and laying hens. Um, but yeah, yeah, you, 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 you definitely, unless you're just going to let them free range over, you know, uh, all your neighbor's places and, and never catch them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to have a feed ration. And so we've moved away in the very beginning. We had a, <clears throat> just because of availability, we had a corn and soy based ration. Uh, we've moved away from that. Uh, in fact, 
the next pigs that we slaughter will have never had any corn or soy in their life. That's and awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're we're trying to obviously do it uh, the best way that we can. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right, next up is it's either Noel or Noel, but uh, we got a farmer calling in. So Noel or Noel, uh, clarify for us and then let us know what the question is. Yes, hi there. Great to connect. Hey. So happy to be on the line. Hi. So I have a question for you. I just moved to five acres of land in Arizona, mapping out some plans for the next planting season, kind of what to grow, where, and how. And water is becoming incredibly scarce here in mm -hmm. Arizona. I'm wondering, Sam, if you can relate to some drier seasons maybe in Texas, and if you have any resources for me or for someone like me, um, on water irrigation for drier climates and, and some planting practices I can implement. Yeah. So five acres, you said, I think, um, you know, yep. you're going to find that different things grow, uh, better in Arizona than they do where I am. We just came out of a really bad drought last summer was really awful for us. In fact, uh, we started looking at irrigation options, you know, obviously we're a little too late to that party. Um, for a small acreage place, they make a, there's actually an irrigation system called, I believe called K pods, um, which I know some other, uh, ranchers near Houston, uh, who, who have those and use them. And they're, <clears throat> they're these sprinklers that, uh, that you can hook up to an ATV or a car and pull them across the pasture so you can move them and water different sections of the pasture, but they, they hit a pretty big area. And I, I would look at a system like that. They're not, you know, maybe a few thousand bucks to invest in something like that. And then you'd need a well that could produce enough, you know, gallons per minute. I think it's 30 gallons a minute or something like that. But, um, but you know, being able to irrigate your pasture, uh, uh, would mm -hmm. be, would be helpful. And, you know, if you don't have a well, if you have a body of water you can pump out of, um, you know, that can work too. Um, but you know, you want as much as you can, you want to try to keep the soil covered and keep living roots in the soil, uh, you know, as much of the year as you can. That's super helpful. Thank you so much. And do you have any reading resources or any, any people that you've looked up to in the space who have maybe imparted some wisdom on you that I could, I could look into a little bit further. Yeah. Um, my favorite books are, uh, dirt to soil by Gabe Brown. Very good book. Um, uh, I'm grass fed there. to finish by right. Alan nation, uh, which is more of like how to grass finish beef. Um, and he's, okay. they're old books, but he's, he's really great. In fact, he's written a lot of good books on pasture management and, and rotating. Um, and then, uh, I'm just now reading Alan Savory's book, uh, forget the title, but yeah, those are great. And then, you know, guys like Joel Salatin, he, pastured poultry profits. That's one, you know, it's like a, if you're going to get into pastured poultry, that's like a really good one to read, but you know, and, and then also I would encourage you to look at YouTube content. Cause there's a lot of guys out there that have great YouTube channels that that's how I learned or at least got inspired to go and try a lot of the things we do on our farm. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. And actually, I'm in the middle of holistic management with yes. uh, by Alan Savory. That's right it. Now. Yeah, yeah. That's me too. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Great. Thanks for reassurance. You bet. Appreciate you. Thank you, Noel. Um, yeah, that that was awesome. So, uh, a YouTube channel just because it came to my mind that I've watched and has helped us with a lot of you know the goats and the chickens. Nature's always right, but like you said, there's tons of them. So mm -hmm. get on the tube, get into those bucks. And uh, my last little quick fire question for you is: What's your personal favorite animal? Um, uh, definitely the the cattle. Yeah, the mm -hmm. beefers. Yeah, yeah, my favorite thing is to watch the meat grass. I yeah. could just sit. My kids get so annoyed. I'm like, let's go for a ride and check the pasture. And they're like, Dad, <laughs> you're not just gonna sit there and watch the cows, are you? And I'm like, Well, come on, don't you like it's beautiful? There, you know. Yeah, so that's very peaceful. Yeah, very meditative. <laughs> it's just thing. cow grazing meditation. I yeah. like it, man. Awesome. So. <laughs> Thanks for this, Sam. It was a pleasure. I want you to uh, invite you now to share like where people can find you, where they should go to keep up to date with you. Where can they find your products locally here in yeah. Austin and also in what stores, all of that stuff. <clears throat> yeah, uh, shirttailcreekfarm.com. We ship uh, in the lower 48, all of our meats. Um, so check that out. We've got a lot of boxes and bundles and, and, uh, and everything. We've got flat rate shipping. 
Um, we've got an Airbnb on the farm. And nice. There's a link through the website. So if you ever want to come stay at the bunkhouse at the farm, it's there. And you can come out and book a farm tour and, and uh, spend a few days and chill in the country. That's awesome. Um, we've got uh, our stores in Austin, the local pastures store in Austin that you can go to seven days a week. So if you're ever in Austin, uh, check that out. And then, of course, we're at three farmers markets in Austin every week. So, Beautiful. Yeah. All right. You're a busy man. So I appreciate <laughs> the time coming out here, taking the drive and sharing your wisdom. It's very inspiring and hopeful what you're doing and yeah just thanks for coming out here man Appreciate thanks for it. having me man this yeah. is cool yeah. awesome thank you thank you all for tuning in uh, please check out shirt tail creek farm and everything that these guys are doing support your local farmers and ranchers friends and we will see you next time peace out all right friends thanks for tuning in to another episode of radical health radio we got a fresh new podcast for you every wednesday if you enjoyed the show consider liking subscribing reviewing and rating us on your podcast platform it helps to spread this message of radical health we'll see you next week